What's up, beautiful divine beings? Welcome to the eighth episode of Conscious Conversation. In this episode, James and I talked about how his entrepreneurial journey got started from a teen with big dreams to dropping out of university and then raising more than half a million pounds for his startup, Levite. We also ended with the episode with some practical advice and steps to help you build a solid foundation for your startup so that you can do the same. This episode was filled with lots of startup-y, investy type of stuff. So if you like that, if you're in that world or you want to learn more about that world, then this episode is definitely for you. And uh, James is just a super awesome guy. I am blessed to call him a friend and you would also learn how we met. And yeah, if you're looking for more growth in your personal development, if you're feeling stuck for a long time, or you just want a little bit more energy, a little bit more direction, more purpose, more motivation, more productivity, and you want someone to guide you along the journey, what you can always do is apply for a two hour free clarity coaching call with me at www.dvkati.com. So after you apply for the call and I feel like, you know what, we might have some good chemistry, then, you know, we'll hop on that deep dive call where I'll do a general assessment of all the areas of your life and understand what's your priority right now, what's your big dreams, what's your goal in 6 to 12 months and just really break it down for you so that you have someone just to hold that space for you to see that big picture. And, you know, you'll definitely leave the call with some insights about yourself and also some practical steps that you can do to take life forward. So if that resonates with you, make sure you take action as soon as possible and hop on my calendar. And I'm looking forward to serve you in our session. Hello, beautiful divine beings. Welcome to the eighth episode of Conscious Conversation. I'm really excited to have James Naylor on the show today. He is the co-founder of Levite, a startup based in London with the mission to improve employees' mental and physical well-being to create a more inspired workforce. He's also my great friend and we have been doing some masterminds alongside with Diego Ola. Olaya. He's also been on the show on the, actually the first Conscious Conversations episode as well. So today, I'm really honored to have you on the show, James. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this, man. Cheers, Marco. It's great to be on, and thank you so much for having me. My man. Okay, so I always like to start off the show by just telling the audience how we met. And uh, this takes us back to, I think, in November last year. Was it about that time? Yeah, I think it was November 2019. Um and I was, so we were at Web Summit in Lisbon, um, and I was there, and we'll, we'll go into, I guess, that during this podcast as well, but I was there with my, um, with my startup, Livite, with my team, or a few members of my team, um, and it was, I think it was like nearing the end of the, the summit, it was kind of the last, last day, um, and I was off, you know, it was near the end of the day, I was kind of like bumming around, um, I don't know, just like seeing other things, speaking to a few people I met, etc., and um, I went back to our stand um, and I remember our developer was kind of manning the stand um, and spoke to him. He said, oh, James, there was this like young guy who came up, um, you know, wanted to know a bit more about Liberté, suggests he should speak, speak to you. Um, he left his card. And I remember just being like, I remember just thinking like, awesome, like someone my age. <laughs> I mean, <we're>, like, <laughs> tech is like predominantly, I guess, younger. But I mean, I'm only 21 and, and Mark, I know you're a bit older, but, um, you know, still... Uh, 22. 22, yeah, there we go. So still like yeah. same age, whereas quite often you're speaking to these guys who are like late 20s, 30s. So it's awesome when you meet someone um, who's your age and I kind of remembered that. So had your card and I think I then just gave you a... I think I then just gave you a call. Um, had your little div- Divi Catty, the purple Divi Catty card. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I think I... Sk- yeah, I gave you a call oh, on WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And then, to be honest, my, my memory here is a bit hazy, but then I remember we met up, didn't we, then? And then we just kind of like got chatting. But I think it's one of those conversations that gets gets lost in the uh, in the passage of time where I can't... I, I remember obviously really getting on with you because then we spoke again afterwards. 
but I can't really remember much around the conversation other than thinking like, this guy's really cool, another young founder, this is awesome, like, this is why I came to Web Summit. Um, and I thought like, oh, it was great that Marco came to our stand and we had a conversation. But beyond that, I can't really remember too much around like what we spoke about. I mean, can you? Yeah, I think we spoke about, well, first of all, like, are you 98 or 99? I'm, I'm October 98. Okay, cool. So you're turning 22 this year. Yeah, turning 22 this year. Yeah, got you. I think the conversation was revolving around just like your story behind like why you started what you started. I think you told me a little bit about like Ho Chi Minh and mm. the incubation center there. And then you were also very passionate about like connecting me to people that you know there was also in my personal development space. And I think we just kind of like touch based on on just a, just knowing each other. Like we didn't really dive deep on the specific subject because i think like we only had like 30 minutes or something like that but it was just like our backgrounds like why are you doing it yeah like what are you doing your vision and things like that and i remember you're like very tall like that's my <laughs> impression i was like this guy this guy's a tall guy yeah, man yeah. and uh, <laughs> i remember like you were very quick you're like for me like your first impression is always very efficient and quick because like when you give someone your business card, like, like rarely you would call them like out of the blue and rarely you'll receive a call. And so like, I was just surprised like, oh damn, I got a call, set up a meeting. And I was also trying to find young founders in the web summit and most people were kind of like older. Mm. Like, so when I saw Levite and uh, was, was who, who, sorry, was it Jack the developer? No, it was Jamie, Jamie the developer. Jamie, Jamie, my, my bad. Like, you guys have Jack, Jamie, James, like all of a sudden with a J, it's so bad. You know what it is? We've just got another developer called Jamie as well. So the team now is Jack, James, James, Jamie, Jamie, Rob, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> and, then, and then Will and Izzy. But other than that, it's like everyone's got the same name. Yeah. <laughs> so James has a big team, man. So a lot of juice that we can learn from him today on this episode as well, which we'll like uh, unpack later on. So continuing with the story, like, yeah, we saw Jamie and just hit him up. And because you were also in the well-being space, so am I. So I think, yeah, there, there, there was a synergy. So I'm glad we had that conversation. And I think the beautiful thing beautiful thing was and in my youtube channel i made this video about like uh how to receive miracles before going to web summit i had i asked for the universe to meet like a to meet a good friend or to just meet other young founders and also to meet potential clients and i think because meeting you led me to all those three things because i through you you referred me to other people that received my coaching as well so like for me, that was just like a crazy little moment right there, man. Yeah, yeah. And I remember after that, though, I think, I don't even, it's one of those things where you like meet someone, you really get on. I can imagine our conversation just kind of like, you know, what we were up to. And then I think we just kind of like stayed in touch just a little bit. Um, you know, it, it's hard to make like a very good friend in a half an hour period, but um, we seemed to like hit it off. And then we somehow stayed in touch, went back to the UK. You did your like, um, you were doing kind of kickoff um like hour-long coaching sessions um like purpose coaching sessions i remember taking you up on on one of those um i've never really done anything like it before but you know i was like i'm in the well-being space i've got to like you know a lot of my friends do stuff like this or people i know so why don't i give it a try to see what it's all about um and then i remember sitting down with you we had like an hour penciled in and we ended up speaking for like two hours or something um and i was like <laughs> really? this is yeah. awesome i love this guy this is so cool uh yeah then like introduce you to a load of my friends as well um who, who did some did some stuff with you but um and then from there it was just kind of like staying in touch wasn't it i mean we kind of uh we did that stayed in touch just on like always on whatsapp not really speaking too much but like you know a few voice notes here and there a few messages here and there and then obviously recently um marco um kind of founded a, a, a mastermind um, it's kind of once a week um, with a group of like similar age people um, with similar missions, values, purposes. Um, and we'd spoken a bit before that, but I think then just like speaking every week and now we speak during the week, it's kind of, that's brought us a lot closer together as well. Um, so it's been quite a journey. It's been what, like, you know, two years almost or not even like one and a half years since I first met you. It's kind of crazy to think. Has it been one and a half years? I don't think it even has oh, no, been a year no, It was yet. November 2019, no. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, been, it's yeah. been like less than a year. Wow, that's not Right. 
Yeah. Because it feels like I've known you for, a, That's for like, I don't know, a long time. It's strange. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, thank thank you for taking up the uh, the coaching sessions first because I feel like that gave me a lot of confidence and like because kn- knowing you right, you're like a high performer, founder, mission like driven, like product uh, a productive kind of dude. But then knowing that I still can add some value through you to what I do, like just gave me a lot of confidence. Saying hey, you know what, like I can also help other people, um, and just proves to me like okay, like coaching does work in some sense, right? Uh, but more about you. Um, what are some like quick fun facts that, you know, uh, you can tell some listeners right now? Okay. F- f- fun, Just, okay, yeah. fun facts about me. So, um, yeah. okay. I, some of these might not be so fun, but, um, okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm 21 years old. Um, I'm a university dropout. Um, I, I'm a world champion. Um, at a, a sport called tin tray racing, where you essentially take a kitchen tin tray um, down a, an Olympic ice track, which is pretty unique. Um, saying world champion sounds big. There are probably only about 20 people in the world who do it, so it's not really a big deal. Um, <laughs> right. I, uh, <laughs> sounds cool, though. <laughs> I originally wanted to um, study finance i wanted to work so different to what i'm doing now but i initially wanted to work in like hedge funds um Mm -hmm. and then i started going towards startups um i started investing when i was um probably about 11 years old um trying to think about other things about me oh yeah i (laughs) I don't know this is relevant at all but i'm also a real country bumpkin so i grew up in the countryside in in the uk um before then moving to uh the big smoke or london um as it's more commonly known um and yeah i mean i, I love to travel as well I'm, I'm kind of um you know i've been in lisbon for the past few months i'm now in stockholm um i love meeting you know a variety of people and and yeah hopefully one day i'll also travel to macau marco but um i don't know i guess those are some quick fire things about me but if, if there's anything else you want to know just uh ask me and i can fire away as well no that was perfect man didn't know you were a world champion right there. <laughs> and you also do a bobsleigh as well, right? Yeah, I do bobsleigh, skeleton, and, and luge, which are all pretty unique sports. But, uh, man, it's it's mm. so much fun. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it can be pretty dangerous. Um, you know, I guess without going into too much detail, I, uh, I met my girlfriend in, like, September of 2018. I do these, like, winter sports. And I was like, you know, it'll be nice. Me taking her, you know, first like holiday abroad, we'll go to Austria, to the Alps, <laughs> you know, beautiful. Um, take her out there, we have a good day, she's loving it. And then on like the, the uh, it was like the second day in, get her on a luge, which is essentially like a toboggan, but you go down a, a proper fast like ice track, um, you know, steep pools like you see in the Olympics. She was going down there, I was waiting at the bottom for her, it was like, you know, 7pm at night, winter, pitch black. I'm waiting and normally it takes like a minute and a half to get from the top of the track to the bottom and it's been like two minutes and I'm getting a bit worried and then it's like three minutes and then suddenly on the loud like personal announcement system on the PA system it's just like there's been a crash on corner eight and I'm like oh shit it's like the first thing I thought was like oh ba- oh shit like this is bad and then I was like oh no like my, my second thought was like fuck you know this is like I really like this girl I've I've blurred my chances i invited out here to have a romantic weekend in the alps how am i going to explain this to her parents and i just run i like run the whole track um it's like a kilometer and a half and i get there by the time i get there there's already an ambulance waiting um and she's just in the corner passed out on her back um at the bottom i'm like oh shit this is bad um and then i get there the ambulance they're like in there take her out put her in the ambulance and mm. we just whizzed to the hospital we were supposed to be skiing the next day and i remember like sat there for like two hours didn't see her uh for those two hours at all and then suddenly she's like wheeled out she's like on her back can't really move with like the head head i don't know what to describe it mm. thing around her head um yeah yeah and <laughs> just remember looking at her and like trying to stay positive and like she was like do you think we can go skiing tomorrow and i just looked at her and i was like <laughs> i was like yeah yeah baby we'll you know we'll be going skiing tomorrow and in my head i was like there's no chance there's no chance we're going skiing tomorrow um anyway you know to cut a long story short it turned out that she'd um she'd fractured her spine um but anyway i mean i guess i guess things worked out okay because what is it like 
almost three years later we're still together which is good but uh, yeah I guess yeah. a, bit of a, yeah, a bit of a tangent to that but it's uh, it's a lot of fun but it, there's definitely some danger to it as well yeah I actually want to go a little bit deeper to this tangent because you know like organically came up you know it wasn't planned but how long like how long did you guys date before this incident was it like a something oh man not long at all so she's she's Swedish um, hence why I'm in Stockholm at the moment and um, I mean I actually so I met her I, I spent two months in here I was working at like a, a mutual fund uh, when I still wanted to well when I was still thinking about getting into like the investment world and um, I was actually I was actually living with her as well um, when I was here um, my godfather had a, like some good friends here and he said that they've got a spare room you can stay with them for two months great um you know i mean that's a whole story in of itself <laughs> anyway that was like you know in my mind you know a very good looking swedish girl who I was with for two months you know 18 year old me i was like ka this is great anyway spent a, yeah. <laughs> spent a lot of time you know i was there for two months obviously i was working during the day but um i'd see her in the mornings have breakfast in the evenings um you know we'd kick back you know watch some tv whatever um but it, that was probably in like september october time so then um that's normally when like i organized to do this like sliding as we call it which is like the bob say skeleton luge in austria um and i normally invite some friends with me um but this year i essentially like really like this girl rebecca um and i was like well you know it's different it's fun you know it's um I thought, you know, I'll show off a bit. No other boy will have, like, taken her sliding in Austria. So hopefully I'll get some brownie points here. So, like, a month and a half in, you know, maybe I had two weeks left. I was like, <laughs> hey, you know, every year I do this thing in, in Austria. Um, you know, I always invite someone. It'd be, you know, it'd be awesome for you to come. It's only, like, three days. Yeah, it's probably, like, three or four days. So it's not very long. Um, right. But, you know, it'd be great for you to come. You know, for me, it was, like, to see her again. Um, but also, you know, it's... It's like a blast. Um, so that was in probably October that I inv invited her. And then it was like literally a month later that we went out together and she she fractured her spine. So honestly, like I, I'd met her. Ha I didn't even know her like three and a half months before the whole thing happened. So <laughs> and then, right, and then okay. I was supposed to be like sliding the rest of the days. You know, I had some friends there and stuff. And um, all I did was like, I'd wake up in the morning I'd stop by because the hospital food was so bad and I'd buy food. You know, I was, I was trying to, still trying to get some brownie points as well. You know, your girlfriend's in hospitals. I'd like, <laughs> I'd buy some flowers or something as well. Although the hospital didn't like that apparently. But um, yeah, we'd rock up and I would just spend the whole day there. Um, so it kind of like, you know, it was, it was, an, it was a great experience mm. because it was, um, I think it's a time when you really get to know someone when, um, mm. when someone's going through like a lot of, a real deal of like stress, probably a lot of like anxiety and worry. Um, I think either it can mm. like push people away or it can mm. really like bring people together. And for me at least, I think it really felt like I got to know Rebecca. Like it was like knowing her for like 12 months in the space of like three days because there was so much mm. when it was like partying and dinners and seeing friends, suddenly like three days in the hospital, like you know, at one point it was like, you know, is she going to walk again with the worry? Um, unfortunately now she's like, you know, completely fine. Maybe some mild back pain every once in a while. But uh, yeah, that was definitely interesting. Like, you know, we weren't even a couple. We weren't even like boyfriend and girlfriend. It was like mm. me still trying to trying to get to that stage and get some brownies. Still trying to holler. She's trying to holler. <laughs> exactly. Still trying to holler. But anyway, I guess it worked out in the end. So I, I, Right, right. That's why I asked because I feel like it it should have uh, or or seeing you guys still together I, I was just assuming that it made you guys even closer because you know in those you know turmoil times that's when you see the real side of people you know it's not those like you know honeymoon kind of kind of phases where you where you really know the true side of people mm. so probably happened no, for a reason yeah yeah it's true it's true um and I remember my, like, my friends as well, they were, I mean, <laughs> all my friends and, like, even my dad goes out there as well and he was like, oh, you know, last day, come out with us. And I was like, no, I've got to, I've got to stay. I've got to, like, this is my duty. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> got to turn that holiday a bit upside down, but it's, uh, but it's true. And, yeah, no, I 100% I agree. It's, it, and, you know, I think it's the same now with, like, coronavirus in a way. I think um, 
for for mm. some people at least there's a lot of like for for me i think i've my family's all been healthy and stuff and have a good relationship with them but on like a lesser level you know a lot of people coming together and like either there's like a lot of stress you know i, I know people whose family members have, have died from it and there's a lot of stress that comes from that but also especially when it was kicking off and there was worry there was a, you really saw people coming together around like a common goal where it's like you know there's this coronavirus people are dying what can we do and you know you saw a lot of like although people are at home you saw a lot of like events pop up a lot of social stuff pop up um and i think it was really nice to see like that cohesion of people supporting each other um which i think so needed when when often there's like a lot of stress and anxiety amongst people um but yeah for sure for sure Although the, the the whole COVID is another rabbit hole that I don't want to go in this episode, but uh, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I get you. Just the sense of community and and, and uh, mm. yeah, in in these turmoil times, man. So I just really want to just uh, direct the combo a little bit into your startup entrepreneurial journey because I feel like that's one of the most interesting things about you. Well you know apart from your you know very your relationship and all the other all the other things that you have you know we're going through the wheel of life baby there's so many different dimensions yeah, in your life, man. um so i just want i'm just wondering like uh, how did your entrepreneurship journey begin like where did it all started yeah so i mean it's hard i don't think i can pinpoint like one point in time where suddenly my like life journey split from where it was already going but rather a like collection of a of a few um Mm -hmm. i think you know even even things i was doing before i knew i even wanted to be an entrepreneur were have directly led me to to be where i am today so you know going back to to me being very passionate about investing it was it was just after the um it was just after the dot-com bubble First, or the sorry, not the, what am I mm-hmm. talking about? I was not alive in two thousand one. It was just after the the Great Recession, so two thousand eight, two thousand nine, um, the the housing crisis, um, and yeah, and it was like after the, after that, um, after that, it had all gone tits up and the market was down. Um, my dad, um, he was kind of like interested in investing, so he kind of got me a bit interested, um, and it was like what was it like probably two thousand ten. Um, so I must have been t- mm-hmm. yeah, t- 10 years old um, and the thing that was great at the time is like you could not know anything about the market pick as long as you had like a semi-diversified portfolio and you'd be making money because the whole market was generally going up so I remember like Cadbury's which is a, a big you know chocolate manufacturing company in the UK mm-hmm. and probably worldwide um, I remember it was coming up to Easter and in my like 10 year old brain I was like well it's coming up to Easter so lots of chocolate let's buy their shares and obviously like you know, I didn't have a lot of money because I was Ted. My dad gave me a little money to like have some fun with. Or it, it was a phantom portfolio, actually. And, um, you know, like Cadbury's went up. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, this is so easy. I was like making more money than my friends who were getting their pocket money. And I, uh, I thought I was like a bit of a businessman. So um, so anyway, like that kind of that kind of continued. But I think that gave me a quite a passion for businesses and like making money from an early age if that makes sense like I, mm. I would remember going in and, and this sounds like a, a bit sad I guess but I'd literally get a, a piece of paper um, and I heard about one of my uh, uh, heard about one of my dad's friends who was like a property developer or maybe not a, a friend more like a colleague and he had a private jet and I was like wow that's like insane um, and he was like a property yeah he's a property guy so what I would do is I'd like when I was like 11 years old, 10, 11, I would get a piece of paper and I'd like write down the price of a property. I'd get a little calculator. I'd like type in how much I spent on doing it up in my mind. And then I'd type in how much I sold it for. And then like, okay, that was my profit. And then I'd reinvest that in a new house. And it was all just on a piece of paper. And it was just like me being a bit lonely, but it was just like, I loved the idea of like doing, and obviously that's not that clever, but like doing clever stuff with business and like making money. And I was very Mm. driven by that. And I think, especially with mm. the investing part, it was about like looking at businesses. So it was like, it, I mean, for me, I was like a value investor uh, that was like value w- with a bit of growth, but um, not at any price essentially. So I'd look at the balance sheet and it was like, that was my start of like analyzing businesses and seeing what made them interesting to invest in. Um, 
So I'd look at everything from like obviously the balance sheet to the team to like what they were doing in the industry. Um, and that got me interested in like just business in general, small and big. Um, and then I started getting into like, before even wanting to be an entrepreneur, into like tech investing in a way. So I'd been investing a lot. And then I had an opportunity to, to invest in like a tech technology startup. Um, looked at it, you know, now I would not invest in it because I've, I've learned a lot. But um, I lost money in, in, in that. It wasn't like a ton of money. I think I invested like, you know, two and a half thousand pounds, which is what maybe like, you know, just over three thousand dollars. So it was, it was quite a lot of money, um, but it, it wasn't like crazy. And that's that's now been been lost. But it was my first like foray into tech investing. And I thought it was awesome to see these businesses that were like you couldn't value them like a billion dollar you know, normal business, but it was like, it was all about the founders, about the team, about the idea. Um, and that got me really like interested in that, but, but I still didn't want to be an entrepreneur when I, when I did that. Um, I think then the, the second part, I've kind of got like, I guess three, three prongs that have like led me on this journey and mm -hmm. I can't point to one exactly. But I think the second was, um, I went and I worked at uh, a big advertising, um, company uh, called JC Deco. I think they're the, the world's largest outdoor advertising agency. You know, if you're, if you're walking around and see an advert outside, you won't have noticed it, but I can guarantee underneath it says JC Deco. Um, now I mention it, you'll notice it the whole time. But I worked with them in London and, um, you know, it was my first kind of internship work experience. I had like two months. I was probably like 16 years old. Um, and uh, it was awesome because it was paid, but I was doing like I was doing, you know, the, the shit work that no one wants to do that they that you always give to an intern at a big company. It's like, okay, you know, making the other guys like teas and coffees. It's like a lot of data entries. So like just Excel spreadsheets, copy and pasting. And, you know, by it was a it was a proper like nine to five. And by the end of the day, I mean, great company, great culture, great people. But by the end of the day, like you want to put a bullet in your head. It's 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 like not fun. It's not fun. Um Anyway, so I, I plowed on with that for, for two months in total, but maybe like, you know, a month and a half in, it was coming to the end. Jack, um, who's my, my co-founder now, he was working at um, one of the big four again as an intern. Um, and we met up um, as we did. We were in London at the time. And I remember walking from, we were in kind of like central London, walking to a pizza place and... Um, called Delfino's Pizza. It's great, by the way. But anyway, so we were on our way there and uh, we were just speaking about what we were doing. And, you know, age 16, you, like, you're slightly naive in what, you, in what you think the world's like. And it was our first experience in like the corporate world. And we just thought like, is this really what it's like? Are we going to like, you know, work now? We've got our A-levels. We've got to work hard. Maybe take a year out for a, a year off, then go to university and then like do this again. Like, you know, kind of in our minds, we're like, fuck that. Like, that, that's not what we, that's not what we want to do. Mm. Like, are we really going to be, you know, doing like day entry, Excel spreadsheets, like making coffees in like five years time? Um, and I mean, Jack would, I mean, Jack had nothing to, he was actually watching YouTube videos. I was actually, I think I'd rather be watching YouTube videos than what I was doing. But we, um, but someone needs to do it. But then Jack's father is a, uh, an entrepreneur. Um, so founder of a tech company based in London. Um, and my father, although not in the tech space, um, has started his, his well started businesses throughout his whole life. And I think growing up in that environment um, lets you kind of it, it kind of gives you an insight into like the world of entrepreneurship. Like you know, growing up when well, I guess we can go to this every like growing up, you know, my dad would be away when he was like building his business. He was in the states or India or China or whatever for like two weeks to a month at a time, um, and it was you know it was pretty brutal, but it was part of him getting to where he is today and having like a you know successful business and where he can spend more time with my siblings and stuff. Um, but I saw what it was like and I saw that it was like dynamic, it was conversations, it was different to like seeing my other friends' parents who maybe were like, you know, managers or executives in big corporates where it was like a nine to five or nine to six. You know, it was kind of like fun and it was like, or how I saw it was like, this is, this is cool. Um, so I think mm. at that point we're like, you know, this, these internships in London are not, uh, not what we expected. They're not, they're not fun. Um, you know, as an intern, they give you the, the crappy work and we thought like, that's what it's going to be like. So we're like, <laughs> we're like destined for, for more. So we 
literally sat down and, and we decided kind of like then and there, like, let's, let's start a business. Um, let's, let's do this. Um, and like be our own bosses, build a team, come up with an idea. Um, and then we, I mean, I can, do you want me to go into like, because this is a bit of a tangent before I get into the final point. Or you, maybe I'll say the, maybe I'll say the final point and then I'll like circle back to this. But so um, that story doesn't quite finish there and I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, the third one, I think, was when I went to Ho Chi Minh, which I mentioned to, to Marco uh, when I first met him. Um, so I took a year out. I, for the beginning of that, I worked uh, in Stockholm. So that was when I met my, my now girlfriend, Rebecca. Um, so during the time that I went to Austria, et cetera. But in um, 2018, I went to Asia at the beginning of the year. Um, obviously did some backpacking, um, as you do as a, a Brit on a year out. Um, and then, but then I stopped in Ho Chi Minh. So this was after, this was after A-levels? This was after A-levels, yeah. So A-levels concluded okay. in the summer of 2017. Went to Stockholm mm -hmm. for two months to work, September, October. Um, right. Then took some time out before the end of the year. And then in January, I flew to, uh, I flew to Myanmar, actually, um, but anyway, so I spent some time there, um, kind of bummed around, you know, partied as you do when you're like 18 years old in 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 Asia, um, as, a, as like a British person. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and we, yeah. And then I stopped in Ho Chi Minh. It was my last place. So I was actually supposed to go to the Philippines after um, and Cambodia, but I, I stayed in Ho Chi Minh, um, and I was there for like, uh, I mean, not not even too long. Maybe like a maybe like a month. Um, so not, not too long at all, but, um, during that entire month, well, actually, firstly, I still wanted to work in finance. So I sat down with a hedge fund manager out there, um, a guy called Dominic Scriven, um, runs a kind of frontier investment fund. So investing in like, emer like really, not even emerging markets, but like really emerging, like Laos, Myanmar, those kind of countries. Um, and yeah, sat down with him, had a really good chat with him, but, um, to cut a long story short, like asked for an internship, um, but they uh, they didn't essentially have any opportunities, which which was a bit of a bummer because I had a month where I was just like not doing anything. Um, but it was like, look, I you know there's no positions at at um, Dragon Capital, but um, we sponsor a startup accelerator here in Ho Chi Minh. You know, can't guarantee you a job or anything, but I can get you an interview with the with the CEO. You obviously seem like switched on, passionate. You'll work under the CFO, so still in like finance. Um, so I went, I met the guy. Um, you know, st still a still a mentor of mine, um, and um, yeah, just like hit it off. I really liked him, and he was like, "Look, you know, you know, you won't be paid." Um, but we've definitely got work for you to be doing if you if you just want to like do some stuff here in, in Ho Chi Minh. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. And I think it was then just like working with these startups, working with these companies solving like new and novel problems in really clever ways. I think then just like really opened my eyes to the whole startup ecosystem um, to actually sit there and be like, you know, this is awesome. Like, why would I want to sit in a hedge fund or a mutual fund or some kind of investment bank looking at spreadsheets when I can be like solving problems I'm passionate about in in like new and clever ways? Um, so then that's when I like landed back in the UK and was just like to Jack, like let's let's do this. He was working at a startup, um, but like you know, let's take this more seriously than just a bit of a, a bit of a project. Um, so that was kind of the uh, I guess those are like the the three points I guess it was like you know growing up being interested in business my time working in London at a company I didn't like and then um you know my time in my time in Ho Chi Minh and I guess all of those now have just converged into me being very passionate about early stage startups and building businesses beautiful man um there's one one point I just want you to quickly explain what's the difference between value investing and growth investing just really quickly sure so gr growth investing is almost like you know okay so if you're like a growth investor you'd probably invest in stocks like tesla or amazon right you can there's not like looking at their balance sheet there's not that much you can infer from from it you know the fact that like tesla does zero percent of like global um car making profit it does like 2% of all global revenue, yet it represents 30% of the total market uh, in terms of like valuation. 
you know, you're not looking at that from a from a balance sheet perspective and being like, this company isn't profitable yet, can, like makes 2% of Toyota's revenue, yet is like now more valuable than that company. You're investing in it because you're like, there's a future in electric vehicles. Um, Elon Musk is an absolute legend and a, a pioneer and a visionary. Um, and this company is going to grow. The total addressable market is expanding exponentially. Let's go in here because... I don't want to like miss this ride and this company one day is going to be like even more valuable and start turning a profit. Value investing is kind of like what, I don't know, like Warren Buffett does. So it would be taking a company, established company like Coca-Cola, right? They're established, they've got revenues, they've got profits. And then you can really look at their balance sheet to say, um, okay, based on their like, you know, I don't know, like EBITDA, um, their like enterprise value, like all these things are like all these... Um, all these metrics, you can infer, okay, does the stock price represent the value of this company? So actually looking at Coca-Cola and being like, okay, well, it's trading at, I don't know what Coca-Cola trades at, I don't invest in, in Coke, but let's say it's like $100. Yeah. Maybe, let's say it's like $100. Coke's trading currently at $100, but looking at its balance sheet, I think the value of the company is actually maybe 20% above that. So I think Coke should be trading at 120 So I buy at 100 and then I sit there in the market and the idea being that over time, the market should realize and adjust itself so that in like a year's time, you've made a 20% return and it's sitting at a 120. Um, so that's more like, um, maybe not like inequalities, but discrepancies in the market in terms of the share price in the company. And growth is just like, uh, it's like I'm essentially betting, I'm gambling on this company. I'm betting on this company to grow. Um, you know, it's not based on the numbers, but it's based on like my projections and how I feel about this business, um, essentially. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. That's investing one on one right there. Uh, different school of thoughts right there. Yeah. I just want to clarify for the people that might be, oh, what's, what's, what's in value investing versus growth. So thank you for explaining that. And uh, thanks for sharing the story as well. Uh, you said that there's a story that you want to come back to after you explain the three prongs. Um, do you want to continue with that, the story? Yeah. So, I mean, it was just kind of like, yeah, you know, I guess that story is just like prolonged in, until we actually start the business. But um, we, so we met up and we were like, you know, we were like, okay, we want to do this. And I think that's when we wanted a, so Ho Chi Minh was when I wanted to start a business. And that was when mm -hmm. I wanted to start like a project, um, if that makes sense. Um, so we left there and we were like, okay, we need to come up with like a, a startup idea. Um, and I remember sat on the, the train home from London, because as I mentioned, like grew up in the countryside. Um, so it's like, you know, two hours to where, and Jack lives, Jack's like a, a neighbor of mine, essentially lives like, well, close by, but that's like 40 minutes away in the countryside, like everything's 40 minutes away. But, you know, I'd, I'd <laughs> yeah. consider that close. Um, but yeah. we, um, yeah, so, but I remember on the train home, we were like coming up with ideas. We were like, you know, 17, maybe 16, 17 at the time. I can't really remember exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, and we were, and I think a lot of founders are like this, and I see it now, even with founders now, we were very naive in the fact that we thought that like everyone would have steal our idea. It's like you meet a lot of founders and they don't want to tell anyone. And that was us. Like even on a train home, you know, we didn't have money. So we're in like the back of the train. Um, and, you know, like six, two 16 year olds coming up with the brainstorming business ideas. And we like were like whispering to each other or like typing them off phone and showing <laughs> each other because like we didn't want the people around <laughs> us to overhear it. Like, I mean, what are the chances? Think about it. Like, you know, the, the, 10 people in a carriage we didn't want like one of them to overhear it and then start this business and like take off under never gonna happen now i'd like speak about all, all ideas openly and i can go into that separately but but i recommend all founders to do that um but anyway we we're coming up with business ideas and we would like come up with loads of them um we would go to jack's father who's this um, tech entrepreneur with them and i mean he was very nice about it but essentially like loads of them you just shoot down or not even shoot down but like ask questions that like a simple questions we hadn't thought about um and it was just like you know why has why have you thought about x y z and it's like oh shit like okay this business idea would be really hard or wouldn't be able to monetize or we couldn't scale it um or there were times i remember coming up with one being like okay i've got the best idea like uber but um for random people so if i was going from like london to i don't know edinburgh <clears throat> I can like say I'm going to London, Edinburgh. Anyone else going can pay me, jump in my car and go. And then like, remember speaking to Jack's father, Andrew, and he was just like, 
blah blah car it was france's first like unicorn business it exists i'm sorry so we're like okay that oh that's a bummer but anyway like i think it was just during that time then that set us on like constantly brainstorming ideas and like from then we were at school together as well and we would sit down in our room um and we would like you know i think we scheduled like half an hour a day where we like either brainstormed ideas or once we had the idea like worked on it um which was a yeah which was a lot of fun um so i guess that that story was just around like us trying to come up with ideas and like led us on the journey and then we had i had the project idea by the time that i went to asia and then i came back from asia and was like okay i don't want this to be a project i want this you know to turn into a business um if that makes right. sense so when when you went to asia you had the idea that you want to start a project of some sort but when you came back you say hey i want to start a startup now yeah well i think like you know i will speak to people right and they'll still call what i do like a, a project in a way i mean look i'm 21 and like i speak to these older people and it's like oh how's your project going and it's like well we've raised like half a million pounds of venture capital we have like a team of 10 you know like it's going pretty well actually but, but it, i guess it's like it's a lot of people still consider like what what like you'll you'll always experience this as a founder i think especially as a young founder like what you're doing is a project which i which i guess it is in a way but i like to think of it as a business but um right. it was it was more that like we so it was then like we had the concept but it was more like you know working on it you know every once in a while you know not every week you know i went traveling i didn't work on it for like three months before that uh we worked on it maybe like you know two hours at a weekend you know maybe if we if we saw each other maybe we could work on like a whole saturday which was like the, you know the entire mm. day mm. but um and it was fun and like we wanted to we wanted to build it and get it off the ground but it was like you know i still want to work in finance um I still want to like yeah and, and this is more like something that I, I'm interested in want to pursue but not in like a full-time role one day it's like it's a bit of like a side hustle that we can always have so we had the concept for the initial version of Livete and then um, we went and then when I went to Asia it was like seeing these people obviously full-time building their startups and being like wow this is okay. awesome yeah this and i, I want to turn this project where we have the concept mm. into you know a full-time business one day and to do that i'm gonna to have to get more serious so i landed back jack was obviously in london he finished his he did a year working in a startup actually um and but like at weekends we would just like work um we'd like you know i had the weeks off because i was just on holiday but jack was working yeah um so i definitely had it easier but like weekends we'd meet up and we'd just like meet at um, there was a Soho house actually in the countryside. I'm not sure if you know Soho House, it's like a members club, but there was a Soho house, um, maybe like 20 minutes from where I live, Soho Farmhouse in Oxfordshire. Um, and I was a member and we'd meet up there and we'd sit on the sofas with our laptops and we would just like pitch decks, um, business plans, like brainstorming, all this stuff, um, you know, building Wix sites and stuff like that. Um, so it was just like, I think Asia is when it turned serious. Like I don't want to work in finance anymore. I want to work in startups. Gotcha. And then, and then did you and then how did you transition into going to the university uh were you in university when you were going to the soho house or, or was that during the summer and then did you go to the same university that jack went to so i so when i went to like the soho house that was before i went to university so okay. that was like in the summer so in in the uk um universities start in september time um, at least in your first yeah. year, they start in September for your like freshers, obviously market, you know that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was in like the summer leading up to that. So maybe the few months beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. And we were working a lot, a lot on it then. So we were working on that, working on it weekends, really like enthralled by it. And um, then my family actually moved out to Lisbon. So I didn't work on it just a bit before university. But, you know, we'd jump on calls at like, I mean, we jumped on quite a lot of calls actually we jumped on calls like most days you know definitely weekends when we had more time and um i remember speaking to my dad at the time being like i don't want to go to university like i i think university is great and powerful and it, and it definitely unlocks doors and i'm not one of those people who's like bashing university like whatever university is great but for some people um you know if you look at the stats the majority of people actually like regret their university course which is kind of crazy um so i uh i didn't want to go um but my dad was like look you know it's, it's early days and i think it was only like parents should do they were like you know they kind of 
implored me to go. My my dad's not the kind of guy who's like going to force me or cut me off if I'm not. But he was like, look, I would really recommend you go. It's a project at the moment we hadn't raised any money. It would have been naive as well not to go to university then. So went off to university, um, still doing this. And then that's when we, like, it was during Freshers' Week, you know, so I'd, I'd be out clubbing, um, you know, as you do in, in the UK, on like Freshers, you know, you go clubbing like every day of the week. I remember, I wouldn't tell my investors this, but it would be like, you know, I'd go out clubbing on like a Monday night. I would get back at like, um, you know, not like too late, but you know, like 3, 3 a.m. <laughs> not um, too late, yeah. Like 4, 4 a.m. I get, I get quite late, but you know, not like, you know, quite often people come back at like 10 a.m. in the morning at university. So come back at like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. And then I'd wake up at like 9, um, you know, want to get my beauty sleep. And then like, or I'd have call, I'd have like a call with an investor scheduled at like 9 a.m. And I'd wake up and like before bed, I'd like down like two bottles of water, um, you know, maybe like if there, if there was any kind of like hangover pill I could take to like um, make me feel better. And I wake up at like 8.55 and I'm like, okay, I've got a call with a big investor in like five minutes. So naive, don't do this. But anyway, I'd wake up, you know, I'd feel like shit. And then I'd jump on the phone and I would call these investors and I would pitch them Livete. Um, and I did that for, and the, the, when we were raising money, it was like during Freshers Week and, and a bit beyond. Um, but yeah, and in the end, we raised like a, a small round from like, it was a friends and family round with like, you know, a few angels. It was like 50,000 pounds, so not a ton of money. Um, but, but you know, when you're 18 years old, it's awesome. Um, so raised the money. Um, and then it was just about like building the business. Then we had some uh, wireframes. So then we like hired a designer to come on. Um, he kind of worked like project based with us. Um, that went through until like the new year. And then we were interviewing lots of developers. So we interviewed maybe like, I don't know, 10 or so developers and found one guy who was just like insane, like, like insane. He was, he was doing a master's degree at Exeter University. And um, we just thought he was like on another level. Um, it was, it was, you know, we could, he, he's got a very like developer m mind, but when he, like he, he just focuses and he just gets stuff done. Um, so then we hired him and, and then it kind of like, it was just Jack, my co-founder, myself, our designer, um, and Jamie, our developer for a, for a very long time, four of us, um, working away at Livete, building the business, you know, launched an MVP on the app store. Um, and then, I mean, that was what, like a year? Uh, it's not, not that long ago, maybe like a year, probably like a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, or maybe not even not even a year and a half um, that that happened. And now we've grown now to a team of, um, is it nine or 10? But anyway, one, one of the two. <laughs> hey, hey, before we continue with the show, I just want to let you know, if you're enjoying this podcast, you would also most likely enjoy the transformational growth coaching service Divicati provides. The coaching service is designed for people who are looking to figure out the next steps in life, become more controlled of their emotions, or simply setting a solid success foundation. Within three months, most clients transform the way they think, feel, and act. So. If you're interested in experiencing the power of coaching yourself to see if it's an investment that's right for you, what you can do is sign up for our complimentary one hour discovery coaching session at dvkady.com. It will be our pleasure to coach you. That's a little promo. Now let's get back to the show. Man, so how were you able to raise that angel round of uh from friends and family like w was it only based off of an idea or did you have some sort of like market research stats and saying hey you know this is the validation so like why did they give you that 50k yeah so it was it was also raised from a lot of people right so it wasn't just uh you know we we grinded um it wasn't just like you know one wealthy guy with deep pockets who was like fuck it you know i'm gonna give 50k to to to, to um two 18 year olds you know we had two investors that gave ten thousand um, pounds mm -hmm. or invested two thousand pounds and then the others were like you know then there were like two seven thousand pound investments maybe a couple of five thousand and then you know a load of like one thousand pound investments um and it was just kind of like you know selling them on the vision and why like we're best suited to do this at the time Livete was actually a different idea um i don't know if you know this marco um 
But Liberté was a different idea. It was focused on like activities and experiences for young people. Um, so Jack and I basically like, you know, the story we told at least, and I think it's very important for founders to have like a founding story. The story we had was like, you know, we're in London doing that work experience. And, you know, this is, this, I think this is true in any city. Typed in like, you know, kind of newish to London, right? Spent time there, but never lived there for like, you know, I was living there for two months. Type in like things to do London, right? You know, common, probably, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of searches in a city like London um, a year um, or, or even a month probably. And all you get is like Madame Two Swords, Tower of London, London Eye. And when you're like, you know, 18 years old, you, you've done that. You did that when you were like six years old going to London with your family. Like, when you're 18, you you know, in the UK, you can drink. You don't want to go and, like, sit on the London Eye and spend, like, 100 quid going around a big Ferris wheel. Yeah, right. um, so so what we said is, like, we, we wanted to build an app that allowed millennials to find activities and experiences that actually they wanted to do. Um, and I think that's why it made it slightly easier for us to raise because it was a problem that I think investors could visualize quite easily being like well this is true you know i would ask them on the pitch you know like type in in your city right now wherever you are things to do city name and it would always be like catered to tourists and i said there's a massive millennial market out there who's got like disposable incomes who want to do stuff like we're experientially like driven um yet it's so hard to do this there's a gap in the market i've experienced this we can solve it um, so let's like Jack and I are going to go out and build it and you know th then obviously the pitch was like slightly more than that but you know I'd go on and there was data around like billions spent globally on this market uh, we did like surveys with like 300 people our age um, so we could give them data being like there's a problem here um, we've got a solution you know very attractive valuation for startups because we we're mm -hmm. university like very attractive mm -hmm. um, which also made it easier so in terms of like raising the money, that's how we like kind of sold it to them. Um, we had some early wireframes as well. Wireframes are just like the designs for your app. So we'd show it to them being like, look, super simple user interface, really easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to go out and build it and launch it now. Um, so I guess that was like in terms of the investment, like that, that first round, how we kind of did it. And uh, for the first round, what was the startup value that? So we, we raised, and I think, by the way, for people who mess, might not necessarily have worked in like tech startups, this might sound like a lot, but it's really not. We raised £50,000 at a £250,000 pre-money valuation. So after raising the money, the company was valued at £300,000. Um, yeah. Got you. And then how come you pivoted into like the more well-being space, like from that experiential, like for the millennial market, like what got you into that well-being direction sure so i think there are like again you know like like how i said with my startup journey there are like three points i think for this there are more like two two points gotcha um, um i think that um so part of it was just like so we launched this app onto, onto the app store and and google play store um for finding like, millennials find activities and experience it was it was like it was good like I, i'd say it went like you know, for a startup, we were slightly naive. Everyone launches an app first time when you're like, if you launch it when you're young, you kind of launch it and think, right, this is going to get like a million downloads in a day. Um, and obviously that's just not the case. So we launched it over time. Uh, and over time, maybe we got like, you know, in the space of a couple of months, maybe we got like a few thousand downloads in London, which was which was good to us, right? And, you know, we had like, we had like 4.9 stars on the app store. Um, and we... Um, yeah, it was, it was going, it was like, it was for an app, it was going well. But what we realized during that time um, was, and, and just to give an idea, the types of activities and experience we had on there were anything from like art galleries, but more catered towards young people. So maybe like contemporary art, you know, the Jeff Koons kind of stuff, um, you know, like the Damien Hurst, the Basquiat, um, like galleries and like buy their tickets, not through the platform, but we linked to them. Um, you know, things like crazy golf, like rooftop um, bars that had like activities like shuffleboard and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of stuff we had on, mm -hmm. the, on the app. But anyway, we, it was like a real process, but I think we, we, we essentially really realized that there were going to be some real difficulties in monetizing and scaling the platform. We, 
And, and if I was to do this again, uh, I think there can be a business built here. I would do this slightly differently. Um, we didn't think of like how I would think of doing it now necessarily, but essentially in the way we initially thought about doing it is like, Marco, you own like London's top crazy golf place, let's say, okay? The idea would be we would go to you, Marco's crazy golf, and we'd be like, okay, we want, um, you know, it's a Friday evening, we want 10 tickets of yours. Um, and then we would sell them on our platform. We would buy 10 off you, sell them on our platform. We would take the difference. You know, you'd sell them to us below below market value. We'd skim like a, a pound or two mm-hmm, off mm-hmm. the top. That mm-hmm. was the idea. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we realized during that process was that um, these activities quite often, the top ones would not want to give us tickets. If you're... London's top crazy golf place on a Friday or Saturday night or even on a Monday night for that matter you're booked out like you know we would go on their websites and like if I wanted to play crazy golf on a Friday uh you know you'd ha- it was fun it was like rooftop stuff you know you get some drinks you know I wouldn't be able to book it for a Friday evening prime time for like a month why would you at Marco's crazy golf give mm. me at Livete a ticket if you can sell them anyway if you're just going to like you know, you know you're going to sell them. You know, okay, fine. You're guaranteed you're selling them to me, but you're selling them for like two, two pounds, three pounds below what you'd get normally. Why the fuck are you going to do that? Um, so all that ended up happening was like the the companies that wanted to give us tickets were the um, the ones that weren't so good. Um, you know, places that like, couldn't really sell out that kind of had some spare tickets. Um, so that was a problem. And then it was just like the the market. You know, like. Get, getting kind of like slightly more technical just looking at like the lifetime value of these people um you know you'd really have to make Liberty like the go-to app and you would have to bring these great activities on to make it great you know we're making like you know okay you got an activity in london for a young person they're cheap it's like seven quid it's like you know okay it's like between five and twenty pounds um which is probably i don't know seven to like thirty dollars or whatever um we're taking commission on that you know trying to take fifteen percent um you know on a on a five pound booking you're making like 75 pence or maybe like a dollar like you need to operate a real scale before you're making money um and it can be done but like in the way that we were thinking of doing it it was so difficult you had to have relationships with all of these providers Mm -hmm. then you'd have to launch like internationally so monetizing it properly and scaling it was going to be seriously expensive and and i think the like basic um, economics just didn't work um but during that during that journey, we'd been, um, you know, we'd been speaking with our friends. We made friends who like worked in these like corporates and stuff like that. Um, spoke with like business owners who are our mentors, and they were like, "Look, I think this is awesome. We do a lot of like, from a business perspective, we do a lot of like team building stuff, a lot of activities, a lot of experiences, and um, and as we like heard more and more, a lot of that focus was actually on like well being." So it's like, oh, you know, we do we do activities. It's like, what do you do? It's like, oh, we do like yoga together. Or, oh, yeah, we always go and do like a hit class, or we bring like a personal trainer into the office. And um, we're like, how do you do it? And they would be like, oh, our office manager looks around and be like, oh, can we speak to the office manager? Office manager would uh, be like, oh, it's such a pain. Like, okay, once we have relationships with them, it's okay. But we're like phoning them up. Some of them don't pick up. Some of them don't have times. Some of them don't have capacity, trying to find prices, trying to compare. It's an absolute nightmare. So so that definitely helped as well. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why we went towards wellbeing because it was also very easy for us to go in different directions. Um, but another reason was just from like a, a personal perspective. Um, a close family member of mine had, has, had been struggling uh, or has been struggling for the past uh, five or six years with uh, a relatively severe mental health disorder. Um, being like in and out of hospital um, and during that time um, there was my sister actually um, which probably makes it easier but during that time my sister's gone very into like yoga um, you know she does some like breathing stuff like that and it's it was amazing to me to see her like come home you know of course there are times when like things are very stressful there's a lot of anxiety there's a lot of stress but doing that like half an hour of yoga, you know, maybe some breathing, one of the only times you'd see a lot of these stresses and anxieties leave her. Um, incredible to see the impact that these small actions would have on her mental well-being. Um, and then when I was there, I was kind of, you know, of course, I, I like thought about that. And then I thought about back to my time in Asia where, you know, 
they they kind of work hard and um you know there's stress there's anxiety there's burnout same in london same in stockholm same all over the world and it's like well i've seen with my sister how these small actions could have such a powerful impact on her like well-being is there a way that we can bring that to the workforce can we make it easier for businesses to engage in well-being for their teams to then get those incredible benefits i saw for my sister but for their workforce people being happier more productive you know less time off lower employee churn not only great for the employee themselves but then for the business there's a massive benefit to actually spending on the, the their people policies so that's kind of led to where we are today where essentially we're like an app we sell to businesses uh, so we sell to like HR teams, their decision makers' budgets, um, but they essentially buy access to an app that we then give to their employees that houses resources to help them look after their well-being. So like anything from like meditation to nutrition to like financial well-being, um, and yeah, essentially like a tool set for employees to look after themselves. <laughs> I just love that your your, your flow. Um, thank you for sharing the story there. I don't think I've ever asked you in terms of like well-being as well. Like obviously you're into coaching. Um, I think it's always really interesting to hear like, you know, when I'm with a founder, one of the most interesting talking points is around why do you want, like why this startup essentially, like why are you doing X or Y or Z? And it just like, what's great when you speak to them is that you can go so deep into that topic because startup founders, I mean, you know, they're they're like, they're kind of like every day it's like going into survival mode for your startup like trying to get it to survive um and understanding why like a founder is in that space is so interesting because their knowledge base is so deep on that subject and they're so passionate about it but in terms of like divi catty as well like what i don't know if i've ever asked you like why why kind of like purpose coaching what what was it for you that got you like really passionate about that like area and then wanting to build like a you know build divicati you know i don't know where it's going to go but it's you know definitely a business in in that space yeah so i think i look through the lenses of the golden circle uh first of all if if people that do not know the girl golden circle is a concept by simon Sinek from the book start with why and the core of it is the why and then it's the how and it's the what right so you look at me right now i'm doing purpose coaching but that's just the what uh to the how and to the why i'm always refining my uh golden circle the why the purpose of anything i'm doing right now is tied to my personal purpose and i see my business as a means to achieve my personal purpose through the things i love to do right and so i'm currently my personal purpose that's something that really resonates with me is to become the most enlightened version that i possibly could be understanding my relationship towards god or my spirituality and it's just a question that i always have since as a child like why am i here in this world it's still some sort of like a problem that i haven't totally figured out yet but i figured out one of the most meaningful things in the world is to create a more conscious and loving world meaning people are more aware of the different consciousness you know there's something called spiral dynamics where uh there's different level of consciousness and depending on the on the people and where they are in the Maslow hacker needs right so like for me i'm still trying to understand okay what's the point of everyone being enlightened okay what's the point of like god creating everything so like i the 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 why is always evolving but as of right now is to create a more conscious world. And I feel for me, bro, like I feel that if I can help unlock everyone's purpose in this life, understanding, okay, what do they actually want to do and why they are here in this world? I believe that everyone has a personal purpose, meaning like there's certain karma, certain lessons, certain insight they have to unlock in, in order to spiritually evolve into the next dimension. But there's also like an altruistic impact they want to make because deep down we're driven we're hardwired to help other people uh people that had have the most joys are people that help and therefore like if i'm able to help unlock people's desire and their their altruistic kind of behavior and their tendencies then that will create a ripple effect right think about like a wall street uh broker you know sorry i'm using this like you know um cliche kind of example of like oh they just want to you know go up, wake up every day how to maximize um 
kind of like how to make the most money however if i if i help like a wall street broker understand okay his purpose in life he can see the same job in a different lens for example like oh i'm helping people manage their wealth so that they can live in abundance or i can use this finance uh this money to direct towards you know the most impactful projects and so i think just helping people understand like why they're doing what they're doing is something that not a lot of people spend time thinking about or it's it's a hard question to answer because you have to really go within we always like look for society tell us like what success look like or our parents especially in asian culture to direct which you know career or how we should live our lives right but we we rarely spend that time to go inwards and say okay what's authentic to me what's my life purpose what's my core values at the end of the day like there's something called the death meditation right like i highly recommend everyone to do it shout out to diego who like was writing this whole paragraph on the uh, on the mastermind whatsapp group about like when when you die like what what really matters the most and when i when you reflect upon that you're like oh yeah when i die okay what's what's really meaningful to me is it money is this material possession is it these recognitions is these like our baseline tendency is just to feel these love to feel these all these high vibrational emotions so how can we like basically experience that in our day-to-day lives and and like for me bro like i'm a i'm someone that is a bit naive or like a bit um people that like would imagine and and although i don't like right now in this world is so fucked up with so many different things going on in the world racism war you know but like i i envision a world where it's way more harmonious people living in the baseline of love there's abundance there's enough food there's enough affordable housing we don't have to worry about any of that probably there's flying cars free renewable energy and we can just be in the space where we're like yo like let's not worry about these like physical needs and we can like put more of our time into like our spirituality meditating open our third eye feeling the kundalini feeling um all these different things doing more psychedelics like going to like a trip in peru doing like a little ayahuasca like understanding that this reality is only just a like one layer of fabrication there's so much more dimension like i was just listening to a joe rogan podcast where it's like oh if you do mushroom if you do a have enough dose you'll see aliens you'll see other things so like this kind of dimension does not look as uh, real or even the dmt dimension is actually more vivid than this one so like i think my evolution of my business would you know evolve as i personally involve and as i have more people into the team that also have the same mission and can kind of refine the why to its pure essence of like okay what's really good for the world and how can we do that the best that we can is it to help people solve their childhood traumas because that's the root of a lot a lot of people's issues is it to like create more conscious uh clothing um like what diego is doing or are we doing more conscious conversation create become like a more educational company and spreading more woke kind of information out there so right now as of right now like coaching is something that's like aligned to me but like I mentioned to you in our uh, offline conversation that, hey, I'm also thinking about uh, creating more retreat based businesses. So the what of it is just coaching as of right now, but it always revolves around the golden circle, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think quite often like startup founders um, can kind of get lost in that and it can be very damaging to the business to not start with the why, but quite often they start with like the how. And the problem is if you start with the how, then you can be uh, you can be very entrenched in what you're doing and you can't, if, if you're starting with the how, it's, you're keeping your ears open. It's, oh, sorry, if you start with the why, you're keeping your ears open. It's like, I know why I want to do this, but I don't yet know how I'm going to do this. So I need to like, listen to the market, listen to the feedback I'm guessing, le- listen to my users to build that how that really solves that why. Whereas you start with the how, which is like, I don't know, let's say for us, it's like an app you know, then then it's like, okay, it's only ever going to be like this. And actually, we're trying to change the why rather than the how, which is just like completely the wrong way around. You know, what I didn't mention in my story earlier was actually our business started as like a marketplace, like how Airbnb connects 
travelers with places to stay. We connected businesses with well-being activities like yoga, personal trainings, etc. And then listening to like the market, listening to our users, we the business almost like migrated towards this app. Um, so yeah, it's just about like keep it keeping it open. Sorry, Mark, I'm kind of like flipping the flipping the podcast around here, but I got another question as well because I think you spoke a lot about like you spoke about your why and you're very clear on your why. But like you know, there's there's a reason why that's your why. Like for me, I'm passionate about well being. You know, predominantly because I've seen the incredible benefits that come from it from from my sister. I've seen the impact it can have, and I want to like improve everybody's mental and physical well being in the workplace. Um, I know that's what I want to do, and there are like reasons in my life for that. Both like business reasons, like you know, I've seen that there's a market here, but also personal reasons. Like it it is unusual for someone at 22 to be um, obviously they exist, but like to be into um, coaching spirituality to be I think so sure in their like why at their age you are and there must have been a reason um, at some point or like reasons beforehand why you like w- why that's what you're going after are you happy to right. like, share, share those <laughs> for sure for sure just a quick comment before that is like for sure like a lot of founders could be attached to the idea and that's also something that I've experienced. Like I'm doing coaching, I'm doing coaching, but no, like that's why this to start with why book is a highly recommend book for any entrepreneurs out there just to have that concept ingrained to like always reconnect back to your why because that's all the great comedies that do. Like they they remember their why. Um, about kind of like like why I'm how I discovered my why. I think there's a great saying. I think it's like your growth can come in two ways. One from pain and one through insight so for me like the reason why i feel like i'm a little bit more mature or i I grew up a little bit like faster than than most you know young adults is because you know of my childhood kind of like trauma i won't say it's like a trauma but like i think it's just because of my parents kind of like separation in middle school i think i shared a story like in different you know videos before um but that kind of like made me like oh damn i have to be the man of the family um, I have to like stand up or or like I, I really put a burden on myself. I put a pressure on myself to actually like start making some money, start like helping my family out. I think that's why a lot of like, you know, maybe developing countries have that hustle mentality. Same thing. Right. Uh, but then I also see like what's possible in my life, like because I always grew up without same same as you like with with the, with the hitting the nine to five kind of like hamster real lifestyle and i i know that there's more out there for me but as i'm going through the entrepreneur route the startup route what i was realizing i think for me i'm always attracted to people that are happy i'm always attracted to people that like are living a good life and the first is like all oh, business people like but then when I went to SF, right, I, I just saw like, okay, there's some people that's really successful, but they don't seem that happy. But then what really drove me like naturally was like, oh, like personal development. And I really resonated with that route. And through like reading the book, Think and Grow Rich, like uh, Napoleon Hill, the author talked about like infinite intelligence, meditation. So that opened a new door for me. And I, when I got some life coaching, that life coach is also very spiritual, and therefore i was like yo man um when i have when i had a life coach he was very spiritual and he opened up to me to reiki meditation and all that stuff so i was like oh that's really that's really interesting i felt more happy that was also what when i was the most depressed state and and that helped me a lot just how just like how it helped your sister and so you know, by doing these like spiritual activities and also going to India to volunteer and open up to more spirituality for me, I just naturally like fall into this path. Like, okay, there's definitely something more than just our physical, you know, being. And especially also I had a lot of different like psychedelic experiences in Canada. And now I was like, oh my goodness, like this is super weird. And having these, like in Canada, there's this club called the Cannabis Club in UBC, Vancouver, where I, where, where I was, uh, where, where I studied. And every Friday at 4.20 p.m., they would gather and they would smoke. And they would, these people had like the most interesting conversations because 
they were coming from physics, from like um, math, from sociology, from me business. I think I was like only the the only business kid there, <laughs> and uh, some 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 from like biology, and they were all like talking about spirituality, God, and all these kind of things, but in a very like mathematical quantum physics kind of sense. Like we didn't speak the same language at all. I had no idea what they're talking about. But through that, I was like, okay, there's definitely something more here. And I asked myself, like, okay, what's the most meaningful kind of mission to my life if I have to, like, what's my purpose? And I think it will, I also got a lot of influence by the uh, whole concept, like, vibration, consciousness. And from this YouTube channel called, like, from YouTube channels such as RalphSmart.com, Infinite, uh, Infinite Waters, uh, also Aaron Dalty, uh, Spirit Science, and all the, also, like, Tarots and things like that. So, like, I think it, it again with you it's not like one thing that got me into my why i think it's like step by step like the universe slowly show me what i'm ready to receive and through my curiosity and through my questioning i slowly like okay okay this is this is more like it this is more like it and for example like when i went to the meditation center in hong kong for 10 days and i experienced level of consciousness that i haven't experienced before like for example I was just meditating and I just felt as if I was in the universe. Like I had vi- like I had visions of, of, of me like kind of like traveling in space. And it was so weird, bro. <laughs> but like I was like, okay, why did I, how can I experience that? But then that just shows me there's more levels to consciousness that were really taught in the mainstream. And when i'm engaged in more of those activities my well-being improve i'm more happy i'm more creative i'm more inspired so naturally that's what i like as a human being so i'm more gravitated towards that spectrum and knowing that how can i share this good as vibrational energy to more people and yeah so so i think that's kind of like why I'm doing this and why this whole personal development, spiritual development space is what I really am passionate about. And I'm just trying to create something in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's super interesting. I think it's, yeah, no, that's awesome, man. And it's, it's awesome to have like, uh, you know, I think people also often ask like, you know, how do I come up with a startup idea? Like all of this. And I think, the fact is everyone will have experiences in their life that they're passionate about. Everyone will experience problems in their life. Um, and, and the thing that's awesome about like startup world is that everyone's problems are different and unique. You know, like what I'm passionate about, you know, maybe like closely aligned to, to, to you or other people, but there's still differences. And I think it's about like, if you really want to come up with like a or start a, you know, if you want to start a startup, um, firstly, it's about just being conscious. Like what am I, what are the, problems that I experience in my day-to-day life that I'm passionate about that I want to solve um you know aligning that with with your purpose is obviously I think an important aspect um but it can also be like looking back um and and how you look back is obviously like up to you I think you know things like meditation mindfulness um you know I love breath work we're all great and, and even though like during breath work I my mind often like wanders um I'm, I mean I'm relatively new to it but when I'm like, it's, it's, it's weird, like, even when I'm focused, sometimes I'll have these, like, ideas pop into my head, just like, you know, I won't actively bring them there, I won't be brainstorming, but they just, like, almost appear, and they're in regard to a problem that I'm, like, thinking about, probably, like, subconscious, and it comes forward, so it's like, I'd say it's just about, like, being present now in, in your life, um, around, like, what, what your experiences are, but then if you can, also looking back, like, what am I passionate about? What has like shaped me to be like passionate about what I am? What problems do I experience not only now, but in the past? And then, and then it's about like, once you're there, then it's getting those and and thinking, okay, how can I, how can I solve these problems? Is there a way to solve these problems? The answer is always yes. Um, You know, is it a problem affecting many people? Can there be a business build out of it? 99% of the time, the answer is also yes. So um, I think, yeah, I think like, as you shared Marco there with like your your why and the reasons for your why, I would implore like everyone looking to a business, although they may not be as like spiritual as yours, Marco, just looking back and be anything like, I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm annoyed with, I don't know, the weather it could be like, so I want to do something there. I don't know, whatever it could be, you know, everyone has something um, and it's about trying to like 
find find those things, find those like nuggets and then solving them. Right. And in the realm of advice to other maybe aspiring entrepreneurs or already entrepreneurs, once you find that idea, what are some of what what are some advice you can give to actualize the idea? Uh, if they create some, if they want to create like a startup, yeah. So the thing I've learned is that it's much easier than you would imagine. Although it sounds kind of rich because it's coming from someone who's you know it's my first startup, right? Um, I'm like two years in, but actually, like people think that it's really difficult to like create a startup. The truth is, it's not. Like you know, there are businesses that have built their businesses on like mailing lists. Um, you know, it's just about. Find so I can tell you like our, our journey just to show you how like simple it is. If I and and really it, it you know there are steps on this that take longer than others. But okay, it, so first of all it was the idea. Like once you have the idea, how do I build this startup? So what we did and we had great mentors. Firstly, I'd employ everyone to get a, a mentor, like someone who's built a business if you can. Um, you know, uh, if if anyone wants to shoot me a question at any point, my my email's James Livite dot com l i v i t a y dot com. You know, I will get back to any emails that, that you send my way um, with, with any questions you have. But first we like, you know, so firstly it was about like refining the business. We had the problem and it's like, how are we going to solve this? So firstly it was kind of like market research. So we looked into the market, we did surveys with our friends, we looked at like published research. Um, you know, what's the size of the market? Do people do activities and experiences? This in terms of like the original Liberté. Um, how much do you spend on these, et cetera? So we have the, the data there. Is there a market? The answer was was yes. People spend on this. Um, then it was like, th- then what we wanted to do was like conceptualize some ideas. So, um, okay, product thinking in of itself is like a, a massive another topic. But there's there's a process for this. But essentially, then like creating the like designs and wireframes for what we wanted to do. So worked with our designer. You know, it's iterative. We would go to our users. We'd do usability tests, which is like giving them the app, asking them to use it, making changes, making tweaks, showing them like two screens next to each other, which one do you prefer? And eventually you get to the stage where then you have like a a fully fledged app that people find easy to use and like. So that was on the design front. You know, we didn't even have a developer then. We'd done market research. We spoke to our users and we built some like ideas for what the app would look like. Raising money is difficult, okay? And and I could do a whole nother podcast with you, Marco, about like processes for raising money as a young founder. So I'm just going to skip past that and just be like, Friends and family, like if you can do friends and family or if you have a bit of money, great. Raise the money or or, or you don't even necessarily need to. Um, if you can find like a technical co-founder, someone who can develop and code. We found a guy, he built our app for us. So we gave him the wireframe, so the designs for the app and he just coded it. Like it took a long time. Um, you know, he was kind of, he was super talented, but we were coding in a language called React Native, which he hadn't used before. And he built it. And and that that was the process. I mean, look there are there are hurdles along the route but it's that was it It was like market research do some designs find a developer build it like everyone thinks oh do i need to like you know get all these like contracts done up register this stuff in the world of startups i mean the answer is probably you you, like you probably should but when you're a startup as long as you trust the people you're working with you don't need to do that like you can launch an app without like incorporating a company Oh, sorry, incorporate the company. That's super easy, at least in the UK. But you don't need to get like contracts drawn up from lawyers that cost thousands of pounds. You can literally like incorporate a company, Liberté Limited, and then build it in the space of like four months and launch it without needing to do much. So if you look at it, go in and think, um, you know, same with Elon Musk, when, and it's obviously slightly different. He wanted to build a rocket company. And he would ask all these people like, what do I need? And they would give him like, he was like, why is rocket so expensive? And all these people would give him answers. But he would like, he would go through that, like the kind of like the five whys, like asking why, why, why. And no one gave him a clear answer as to why rockets were so expensive. And, um, you know, and, and no one believed he could make them really cheap. But it's about like, it's about going through that process. Why is it so difficult? Like, okay, rocket science is slightly more complex than starting a business. But like, if you have your idea and you're telling yourself it's hard, ask yourself, why do you think it's hard? And then move down that chain. And then once you get to that like bottom why the reason i can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be very easy to to address like it's hard because i need to raise money move down that chain and actually you'll probably realize that okay well, maybe along that chain you realize actually i don't need to raise money i just need to find a guy who can code i don't need to spend any money for that i just need to like network um 
So yeah, look at those problems and think about creative and clever ways to solve them because it's it's a lot easier than you think. Got 99% you. Ninety-nine percent of the Got time. You. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the juice right there, James. By the way, how how are you doing on time? Um, man, I'm good. I'm in Stockholm at the moment, so it's uh, it's nine thirty here. But I'm I kind of well. Normally, I'd start working at um, nine Stockholm time, so eight a.m. UK. But my my first meetings at uh, in half an hour at nine a.m. UK. So cool. So are you are you down to do twenty more minutes? Yeah, I'm definitely down. Awesome, awesome. So I just have a quick question about like. Uh, in the entrepreneurial space because you always have to make you know decisions and generate business ideas so that's a two-part questions and again from my impression from you 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 move fast you pivot fast like before the lockdown you were doing like a marketplace but then you switch to a more um just online app right so you know how how do you make decisions and how do you generate business idea ideas when you're already in the business because you need constant stream of inspiration to think of you know new clever things whether that's for like a sales tactic whether that's like thinking about the next innovative moves right so yeah can you just share a little bit about like yeah what's the secret sauce there to make decisions and to generate those juicy ideas man yeah so i'm i'm definitely still learning as well but but i'd say from like okay, so one of the one of the mistakes that we definitely made as a business was making decisions too fast, right? That that's also a problem. As as a founder of a business, you like not the not all the time, but like very often there's like a you know there are subsets, right, of of types of founders, and I'd say a lot of them fit into like that visionary type, which is like you know the Steve Jobs, well, pretty much everyone like Elon Musk, like a lot of the big names, they're they're visionaries, and for them it's about like coming up with like seeing problems and solving them like once you get into that space it's like i see a problem i want to solve it and um the one thing that i would recommend that everyone does when like running a startup is speaking to your users now doing that in the right way though like we knew the importance of speaking to our users but we would listen to them we'd speak to like you know let's say we spoke to five people and all of them let's say there was like problem let's say four of them said problem a two of them said problem b and one of them said problem c we would try and solve problem A, B, and C all at the same time. What you need to do is, is you need to speak to your users, okay? It's very important. Like asking them, what do you like about the app? Doing like usability tests. Ask them to like, if, if it's an app, let's say, using that example, because that's what we had. But you can do this for like, you know, coaching businesses, whatever, in different ways. But for an app, it was like, okay, for, for our initial, uh, original app, it was like book an activity. So where would you go? And like watching them go through that flow. And if there was a page where they were a bit stuck or didn't know what to do, we would note it down and think, okay, there's a problem there. Or then we just like ask for feedback and listen to the problems. It's like, oh, I, I find like, I don't, I don't pay. Uh, I don't like buy tickets because the, the process is quite painful. I have to enter my card every time. Um, and it's like, okay, listen to that. Maybe we can do like integrating Apple Pay or something like that. So it's about not just getting it from yourself but also like from really speak to your users like now we make sure that we try and speak to if we're doing it uh, a user interview which we're going through at the moment you know i've probably got about 12 meetings set up in the next week just speaking to our users because we're coming up with new ideas now every single user is going to have a different problem like there'll, there'll be some problem someone says and it's like just one of the 12 person people have it no offense to that person we're not going to solve it we're, we're, we're just not we're going to leave it like that problem can like it'll go or be put on like some backlog somewhere but right now as a startup we got to like prioritize things and that problem is going to get chucked a thousand miles away in some bin until it like comes back in like i don't know how long what we're going to do is speak to those 12 users and we're going to hear those the eight the the same eight problem or the same problem that eight of them have and we're gonna think okay you know like 70% of our users are having this problem that's that's an issue like that's what we need to solve and it's about prioritizing those now there's some value based in that like if eight people are saying oh I kind of like you know I, I found it hard to change my password and then like three of them are like my app doesn't work we're going to solve the like app doesn't work one before we like do a password because it the impact it has on the user experience is less but it's I would just say like constantly speak to your users like while you're building speak to your users 
after you've launched, speak to your users and feed everything that they say into the like product cycle. Um, understand, prioritize, work with the developers, work with your product team if, you, if you've grown um, and just constantly have your ears to the ground and be like iterative in what you do. But don't make decisions too fast. It's a mistake we've made and we're paying for now. Um, I spoke to a really great product person, a guy based in London. He built a, a very successful tech company. And he was like, when I'm mentoring founders, uh, when I jump on a call with them, he was like, I don't, I don't, I ask them what they build, obviously what they've built new, but he's like, I always ask them what they got rid of um, as well. And he's like, he was like, it's, it's a bad sign when you ask founders what they've got rid of and they're like, I haven't got rid of anything. It's like, okay, when was the last time you got rid of something? And they're like, oh, you know, I can't really remember a time. Speak to your users. Not every feature you build is useful. And what we're doing now is we're having to refine the product and simplify it. Like we could be like, you know, it's, what we're doing right now is getting rid of certain features that aren't used and then going very deep on the issues that like are solving the real pain points of our users. Um, so I guess like just to summarize, it's just like, yeah, speak speak to your users in the right way. And there, there are great articles online that you can read about like product processes and stuff because it's such an important aspect of your business. Awesome, bro. Thank you for sharing that process of yours. And I want to just jump into the more personal development side of things right now to end it off a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, you're a very motivated kind of guy, right? Like, what fuels your fire? Because you said that one thing that you're proud of the conversation that we had yesterday is that you show up uh, regardless of how you're feeling for like two and a half years. You just you just put in the work. So I think not a lot of people, especially our age, you know, are very motivated. Well, like a lot of people, including myself, sometimes have uh, procrastination issues uh, for you like what fuels that fire in your belly bro yeah for sure so I mean ju just to add as well you know there are times when I definitely procrastinate like I'm not some kind of you know I'd love to be like I am some kind of business weapon I show up at like 6 a.m. I finish at 12 and I feel great I like sleep for two hours and then I work like not the case like I I, I go to bed relatively early. I make. I really try and get like actually eight hours. You know, most people probably try and get like seven. I really try and get eight. I think it's really important. Um, but when I'm working, I really try and focus. I think w one thing that definitely took a bit of time for me as well is like, you know, I, when I was at school uh, in my final years, and I was, we were speaking about this yesterday, like I, I tried to, uh, I wanted to do well in my A-levels, which is like UK exams when you, when you get to 18, because I want to go to good university, study finance. Um, or go into finance, I should say. Um, and um, it was very easy then. I knew like, if I work, I'm going to get A stars or A's and I'm going to go to a top university and it's great. Like, it was easy to see the reward at the end. When you're building a startup, what's hard is you have to remain, you have to like self-motivate very often. It's, you know, I've got to get up and I'm going to start working and I'm going to work, look, I don't work 12 hour days. Like, you know, there are people that do, and I, and I think it's ridiculous. Okay, I work longer than an eight hour day and I work like weekends sometimes because that's part of it. But it's very important to prioritize your, your mental health. I'm not some kind of like ridiculous guy who who works for like 18 hour shifts. Um, but it's, a, yeah, it's about like always seeing that goal that's in sight. And like, what is it that motivates me? Okay, first of all, it's like, first of all, it's, I hear, and what's what's powerful is I hear from users. I get messages from people on LinkedIn being like, hey, you know, like just reaching out because I'm like one of the founders of LinkedIn, one of the, sorry, LinkedIn, one of the co-founders of Livite, being like, um, you know, oh, I've used the app and it was like awesome. It's really helped me. I love this course or, or stuff like this, or I love that meditation. That's very powerful. I And like knowing that I can help more people, you know, at the moment we're, we're in like businesses that probably represent maybe like seven, seven or 8,000 employees. Like I want to go out and I want to make this like a global business. Like I want to, uh, I want to roll out across like you know the biggest companies in the world. I want like Walmart employees, like all of them, to have like the Liberté app on their phone. Like two million of them, Amazon workers, like the biggest companies. And I want them to benefit from what I'm building. And I know to do that, I have to work hard. So like, and it's about like re reminding yourself. I know Jack, my co-founder, he has like a board that has like you know, almost like his motivations on there. I remember during his A-levels, he just had a whiteboard that just said like 100% productivity. And like, whenever he was like kind of slacking, he would look at me like 100% productivity, like that's what I gotta do. But for me, it's more about like, what what's my, what's my purpose here? It's like, when I'm kind of like, if I'm feeling slightly unmotivated, it's like, okay, that's my end goal. And I'm not gonna reach that goal by sitting on my ass and watching YouTube videos for the next three hours on like a Monday morning. Um, it's like, 
I'm going to have to put put this work in. I'm going to have to send some sales emails that I just don't want to send, but it's like part of it. Um, I'm I'm also very passionate about what I'm doing. I'm with people I love. You know, Jack, my co-founder, he's like a very close friend of mine. We motivate each other. You know, like we're doing now, Marco, with a Zoom call. It's so much easier to motivate. I'm not even really self-motivating. I'm jumping on a call with him and we're working together. It's like, you know, it's so much easier when you when you have like a study buddy, right? Rather than working alone. And it's the same with businesses. If you can find a co-founder, it's much easier. And then, you know, there definitely are the areas of my life that I like, you know, I, I'm still motivated by um, like finan- finances. Like I'm not making much money now as a startup founder. My, my equity in the business for a 21 year old is obviously um, is obviously great. Um, but, but obviously it's hidden, right? It's, it's hidden. I, I can't access it now. And I am also driven by, by like uh, wealth for myself about like, you know, I want to grow up. I want to have a family. I want to be able to provide for them when I'm young. I want to live a good life. I want to go on nice holidays. Um, you know, there's definitely a selfish reason as well. And think about, I think it's like, if you can realize what motivates you when you're when you're like procrastinating, watching those YouTube videos, you know, I don't know, whatever it could be, think about like, am I going to reach my goal? Am I like in line with my purpose right now when I'm watching YouTube or whatever it could be? And and look, I also just want to say watching YouTube, watching Netflix, sitting down is is important. Like you're also not going to reach your goal by just working 24-7. Like you've got to sleep well, you've got to like see friends, you've got to socialize, but you've got to put in the work and if you're if you're not putting in the work like you should do i think for me at least it's like you know however you want to do it whether it's sticky notes whether it's just in your mind whether it's a giant whiteboard like jack what are your priorities right now what what's your purpose and like if you're not motivated thinking again what can i do to align myself with that and i think that's what's important yeah that's that's so important man i think a lot of young people right now is is lacking that motivation and that's why that goes back to your question like the purpose coaching because once you unlock that then that would be the underlying kind of thing that would motivate you because if you don't have a bigger why it's it's just hard to get motivated by the what right sometimes it's necessity that that we we have to do it but also one thought that i love in my mind is like oh if i don't do it nothing would change like if i don't like my current situation right now if i don't like how i'm feeling the the results i'm getting whether that's in my uh, romance whether that's in my finance whether that's in uh my business if i don't do anything nothing would freaking change and that's why like i can't be in the zone of avoidance i gotta be in the zone of action and just stepping into the fear i feel like fear of failure feel fear of rejection right is our inner demons that stop a lot of a lot of us from actually following what our heart really want, what our tuition is guiding us towards. And uh, yeah, man, I think 100% what you said there, having a co-founder or some sort of like accountability partner, even the mastermind that we formulated, right, is really helping a lot because you have that peer support. And last week you weren't on the call, uh, but I was basically very depressed and upset because i feel like i'm I'm not really progressing but after just talking to favor and diego bro like my whole vibe changed like they helped me like visualize okay what's possible and like just give a perspective like hey man like look at the broader perspective of things like, it's actually not too bad like i graduated in three years and i'm already like one year ahead doing like what i'm supposed to be doing although you know it's not really uh, fruitful right now as a, as of you right now not, not making a lot of money at least we're on that right direction and we're still young and we still have that energy so very well said man um i think it's yeah i think i think it's important and even then like you know even if you so lots of people don't have co-founders but then it's just about like yeah building that support network around you whether it's mentors whether it's friends and people who are aligned with you is, is you you know what you know, even Jack and I, right, like we bounce off each other a lot and we help each other. But there are times when we become like stagnant. There's a problem that we're trying to solve and we can't think of a new way to like solve it. And it's so important often to just get a fresh pair of eyes on it and then try something new and it clicks. And, you know, that can just be, yeah, as I said, like friends, mentors. And, you know, for you, Mark, obviously you don't have a co-founder, but you've managed to build a network of people around you who can give you that perspective. You try to solve the problem, you know, lots of the time it does work, but as with all people, sometimes it doesn't work and like you just can't think of another way to solve it or you get frustrated or you get demotivated and you speak to someone about it and they're like, well, actually, like, have you thought about this? I think this could really work. And then, or have you thought about what you've already achieved? And then it's just like that new, 
it just like pushes you, it motivates you up. Um, so I think that's also a really important aspect. Finding people who can like help you on your journey and who are aligned with you is, is so important as well. For sure, for sure. And by the way, uh, for people that do not understand, uh, know what mastermind is, it's a concept by Napoleon Hill. Mean, like what it means is like bringing people together with the same mindset, attitude, values, and operating under the spirit of harmony to achieve a common purpose. So for us in the mastermind, we're about like personal development, spiritual development, sharing um, what the resources that help each other grow. And each of the members of the mastermind has their own business. Um, so that's that's why it makes it powerful. Um, so to, to end to end this off conversation a little bit, I have uh, two more questions. One is just quickly, what are your favorite uh, books, whether that's for spirituality, business, personal growth? Yeah. Yeah. So um, something that I'm I'm not good at is is reading. Um, you know, I know Marco, you, you you read a lot, and it's something that I'm I'm relatively jealous of you of actually. I like the ability to just plow through books. So I. So the okay the first book is is the lean startup um it's great just like the framework for building a startup is is great but now actually I I read books now to almost escape business if that makes sense like I I live I live in my startup you know like I'm on a call early I finish relatively late and I'm there and I I almost like I think about business in some format all day every day and when I read I want to get lost in like another world. Um, so two books that I would implore, like I think they're, they're just beautiful. Like honestly, my favorite books, and I've, I actually read them both relatively recently. One is The Alchemist. Um, like for, it's not about business. I mean, but there are definitely like lessons you can learn from this like novel, I think that you can apply. Um, I think it's also like relatively spiritual and just like to me at least brought a sense of calm and a real sense of escape. And then the other one, mm -hmm. um, just give me one second because I really want to recommend it because I think it's such a great book. Um, it was, uh, wait, so I know Shangri-La came from it, so that's how I find it. Um, it was called, uh, the Lo oh yeah, Lost Horizon. Um, Lost Horizon, honestly, like one of the most beautiful books I've ever read in my entire life. Like it's a novel, it's fiction, but it like, it ties in um, a lot of things around like spirituality, like I don't know, like importance of life, and and it was just really one that I just like I got I got really lost in. Like it was like an escape where I was in another world, and there are a lot of lessons I think mm. you can also learn from that. But it's written so beautifully and so well. So Lost Horizon would definitely be number one, and The Alchemist number two is like books to just read, which are awesome. And then Lean Startup, if you're looking to do a startup, is just like a great business book. For sure, I could advocate for Alchemist and Lean Startup. I haven't read Lost Horizons yet. I read will, it, Marco. Sure. It's awesome. Yeah, awesome, bro. So to end off the conversation a little bit, I just want to you know give you like you know a little bit of time to just share any message that you really want to share. You know, to other listeners that you know maybe just people that are wanting to start a business or um, just anything, bro. Like from your from your heart, what what do you want to say? Is there? Is yeah. There so I think. Um, so I don't want to come on and just like plug, plug Liberté. I think the first thing I want to say is, um, well, thank you to you, Marco. Um, I think like even from our first conversation where you coached me, there's been so much that you've been able to help me with as well. You know, I'm, I'm not going to like, like coaching was something I hadn't really thought about, especially like purpose coaching, but actually speaking to you, it's amazing. Like the areas of my life that, that like I realized cause and like led to, to who I am today. Um, you know, I think I think just like a message for people listening is actually like, I don't know, the, the, like something that I learned anyway, and I'm sure people listening to you probably understand, but like the power of a coach and like, I think Marco, you're like awesome at that and you've done an awesome job with me. So firstly, like message, thank you so much for having me on and like, thank you for everything you've been able to help me with as well. Um, I don't know, in terms of like other messages, I think just like if, if people are listening, like I, I'm, I, I love helping young founders. Um, you know, I've started like a networking event in London. Um, we've got like a Slack channel now where it's just like for young people in the startup space to help one another. Um, if you're interested, uh, if you have any questions, just reach out, um, you know, either speak to Mark and I'm sure he'll pass on my details or as I said earlier, just james at livitay, L-I-V-I-T-A-Y.com. 
um, you know, I'll check, I'll check my emails, I'll get back to you, like we can schedule a call, whatever. Um, just passionate about helping people looking to start businesses. So I think that's pretty much it. And, and otherwise, yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Mark. It's been awesome. Dude, man. Uh, by the way, I did not tell James to promote my coaching business at all, man. Like, you know, that that was just a, a testimonial from him. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm always, you know, I I have issues believing in myself sometimes, especially with my coaching. So to to hear that from you really means a lot, man. Uh, but anyways, man, I know, I'll, I'll, I know take, I'll take I'll take my um I'll take my advertising fee afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. No, I did not. Yeah, yeah. no, Marco did not ask me to do that. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, but man, but, yeah, uh, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Yeah, James, man, thank you so much. I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for uh, being the guest for the eighth episode of Conscious Conversation. Go check Levitate out if you're an investor in London or you're a company. You know, you know, you want to improve the well being and create a more inspired. Um, conscious workforce then hey levitate might be the startup that you need uh for your company and uh, hey much love to you brother cheers man cheers thanks this is conscious conversation by dv caddy thank you so much for listening if you want more from us please check our youtube channel and instagram we upload there regularly too both at dv caddy if you're a great fit for the show and have a big idea you're passionate to share please reach out at marco at dvkady.com or DM our IG. Lastly, if you want to support the podcast, please follow us, share this with a homie, and leave a nice little review. Thanks again, and as always, much love and peace.